Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. And large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Wouldn't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, Everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Wouldn't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile but it is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To be honest, I find Jesus quite an anomaly. I mean, if you are a public figure and seeking to please many people and get many to follow you, you would say something to inspire them or to give them a motivation to follow you. A great example would be this season of elections in Singapore. Any political nominee, be it from the ruling party or from the opposition, will promise to work for your benefit, speak up on your behalf in parliament, or even embark on upgrading programs for your home. Every leader will always offer you some reason to follow him or her. But not Jesus, seemingly. Instead, when faced with a large crowd of followers, he says the strangest things. If any one of you wants to follow me or join me in my cause, you must hate father, mother, wife, children, brother and sister, and yes, even yourself as well. What a ridiculous thing to demand. It is not only unreasonable, it is also an impossible standard to meet. How is it possible, for example, for us to turn our love for our loved ones into hate? And furthermore, Why should we hate our loved ones? It doesn't make sense, as we are all formed and nurtured by loving relationships. No aspiring leader will ask their followers to do such a thing. You will lose all your followers straight away. Unless, of course, it is the truth. And if forsaking our families and ourselves are the only way possible for discipleship to succeed, then Jesus is actually doing us the greatest favour possible. He's actually laying out the terms on which discipleship can take place. And it is only such a truth that will lead us to embark on and stay on the right path and fully please God. So, is telling the truth always the best thing to do? To find out, I decided to check with my doctor friend 
to see if this is the truth. If telling the patient the truth about his or her condition, no matter how terminal it is, is always the best practice. Well, she tells me yes and gives me three reasons. Firstly, the patient has the right to know. Secondly, the patient or the family has the autonomy to decide what course of treatment is best for the patient. And thirdly, to provide the patient and the family the right mental preparation to face the difficult treatments, if any, ahead. So almost always, doctors would always tell their patients about their true condition for their benefit. And it is the same with us for our spiritual condition. If the only way possible to follow Christ is through the path of self-sacrifice, then our Lord Jesus is actually doing us the greatest good by telling us what it entails. He is not deceiving us for the sake of his own popularity. Rather, he is fully loving and concerned about us to tell us the truth. So let's examine what Jesus is saying. He's actually outlining two conditions which are very closely related. To be his disciple, we must firstly hate our family, relatives, and even ourselves. And secondly, take up our cross and follow him. So first, what does it mean by Jesus asking us to hate our family? The word hate in the Greek is miseo, which means to love someone or something less than someone else or to choose one in favour of the other. Jesus is not asking us to hate our parents or our family, to think bad thoughts about them or to treat them badly. That would contradict other key teachings that God has commanded us in the Bible. For example, the fifth command says we are to honour our father and our mothers. And hating in mistreating others would also contradict Jesus' own actions. He loved his own mother so much that even when he was suffering and dying on the cross, he instructed his disciple, John, to take care of his mother. He was concerned for her welfare, even above his own. But in discipleship, Jesus is calling us to love him and to place him above all else. He's saying that your love for me must take greater priority over everyone else, even your love for those who are closest to you. And just in case you might think that Jesus misspoke somehow and that he didn't really fully mean what he says, he actually emphasizes it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be like you carrying your cross. You choose to identify with me in all that you do and obey all that I tell you to. This is what Jesus is saying to us. And that is what is also meant by what carrying our cross is and following Jesus. In fact, the more I think of both of them, hating and carrying our cross, I see them not as two separate instructions, but as one, each reinforcing the other. As we place Jesus first in our lives above everything else, this is the cross that we are called to bear. And this can be very challenging. For example, in your school or army camp, where you are pressurized to be accepted within your social circle, will you risk losing how others think of you by caring or standing up 
for the person whom everyone is discriminating against. For example, the socially awkward classmate or army mate. Jesus tells you to carry your cross. Or in your workplace, identifying with Christ may mean jeopardizing your promotional prospects. For instance, serving in ministry in church will take up your time and energy, but your boss is actually telling you that he expects you to be on call 24-7 and to devote all of your energies to your work. So, will you draw a line and risk your career advancement by saying that you will continue with your serving in church? Will you carry your cross? Or in your family, where sharing your faith will entail persecution, will you still love your family by sharing your faith and obeying Christ in doing so? Jesus calls you to carry your cross. In all of this, Jesus calls us to carry our cross daily and fully identify with him and obey him in what he says. But that is not all. That is not all that this passage in Luke is telling us. Jesus also calls us to persevere in carrying our cross, which are what the subsequent stories that he says all about. They they all have to do with perseverance to finish the job. You know, I feel sad and regretful when I go on a trip to other countries and see abundant skyscrapers. Developers have actually started on their building projects and gave up halfway. What a waste of manpower, time and resource. And the half-built structures in the middle of the skyline are not only an eyesore to everyone, but a constant reminder of the foolishness of the person who first started on this building and was not able to complete it. He should not have started on it at all. Or how about going to war if your odds of winning are less than 10%? Why would you sacrifice the lives of yourself and all your people under you to go to war for nothing? You would not start on the war, but quickly negotiate a peace settlement with the other party. So Jesus is also saying the same thing in these two stories. If you're not able to complete a building or don't think you can win a war, then don't start on it in the first place. After all, both of these will bring you shame and regret, as well as much losses. So how is this relevant to discipleship? Well, in my 20 plus years of serving as a leader in church, I've seen my fair share of both young and old people who have abandoned their faith. There are all kinds of reasons for that disappointments with circumstances in life or with people in church, being enticed by the pleasures of this world or getting attached to someone who is not a believer and being forced to make a choice. And some of these may have even been very fervent in their Christian walk. I think of this young girl who was very fervent, who was involved in the worship ministry, who was even going on mission trips extended to share the gospel with people in other countries. But now, she has turned away decisively from the faith. And I pray for God's mercy to be upon her, that she will still turn back to God. And I urge all of us to continue to pray for those whom we know who have turned their backs on Christ, that God would have mercy on them to bring them back. 
But you know what? This can happen to any one of us as well. Which is why the warning of Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 is so relevant to us. He says, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We all need to persevere in our journey of discipleship with Christ. Yet, I also want to encourage you at this point, if you are despairing of whether you can actually follow Christ all the way, you may say, this is so difficult. I don't think I can do it. And if you think this way, you are correct. We are all not strong enough to follow Christ on our own strength. But God is the one who will strengthen you for the th- for the task. The Bible gives us God's promise that God, who first began a good work in you, will bring to completion what he has started in your life. So God, the Holy Spirit, will grant you strength each day to be Jesus' disciple. Hold on to God's promise and don't rely on your own strength, but daily pray to and depend on the Holy Spirit for strength. Yet when it all comes down to the crunch, discipleship is still a choice or a decision that we must make for ourselves. You know, last week when Reverend David shared with us about his sermon, also um, there is also a part on discipleship which really struck me. When Jesus dialed up his demands, many of his disciples stopped following him. They could not stomach his teachings and only the 12th state. And that was in John chapter 6. And Reverend David challenged us, when the storms of life dial up as well, will we continue to remain faithful? And that, is the challenge and the cost of discipleship which we must make, which is a decision we must make for ourselves in our lives. So what exactly is this decision we must make? Strangely enough, God does not call us to look very much further ahead, but to obey Him in everything, in the thing that He calls us today at this very moment. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his classic book, The Cause of Discipleship, says this, The first step of obedience is the act of faith according to the word of Christ. In other words, discipleship is about obedience to Christ's command to us each day, no matter how difficult it might seem. That is the cross that we are daily called to bear. So what is the Lord calling you to do today? Is it to reach out with the good news to your neighbour? Is it to show love in tangible ways to your family? Is it to reconcile with your brother or your sister? Or is it to serve God in a greater capacity? Simply make the choice each day with the Spirit's help to obey. And this is the step of faith that Christ is calling you to take. May the Lord lead us in this journey of discipleship so that we can be fully fruitful and effective and so be like salt which maintains its saltiness. And church, this is Christ's challenge to us today, which is all the more relevant, seeing that we are facing such challenging circumstances and so many people around us need the love and the good news of Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin 
and has sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God bless you.